come sit on the floor in front of me here, and we're just going to talk for a little while. <clears throat> How you doing? Hi, Brielle. You look beautiful. Hi, you look beautiful too. How you guys doing well? Come on in. <clears throat> so, today I'd like to ask you a question. How many of you think that you can stretch really far? Think you can stretch really far? Okay, let's see. We're going to try. You'll stand here and I'll stand there. We'll see if you can stretch farther, okay? Stand right here. We're going to use your hand. Let me see. How, okay, come on up. See how far you can stretch out. Just reach out. Whoa, that's not bad. All right. Dude, you could stretch farther than me. You're amazing. All right. How many of you think you can stretch as far that way as you can that way? Think you can do that? Watch, watch this. Watch your head. Anybody can do that? I mean, that takes some skill. <laughs> you might fall over if you tried it. But I'm 57 years old. I've been doing it since I was your age. The Bible tells us today, we're going to, oops, sorry. The Bible tells us today, we're going to need to stretch. And sometimes, sometimes, Stretching is hard, like you stretch as hard as you can to reach cookies on the counter. Sometimes you stretch. But what we're stretching for, if you believe in Jesus, is something that you'll definitely be able to take hold of. You will be able to take hold of it. And it's heaven. And it's in the future. But if you stretch and grab hold of it now, you get a little bit of a taste of what heaven is like. You get Jesus' love for you. You get his presence with you, like we're all sitting here. He's with us now. You get to be able to live the way he says you can live now. You don't have to wait till you're in heaven. If you can grab hold of it, it's yours now, even though it's in the future. All you need to do is stretch and take hold. So let's practice. I invite you to stand and I'll send you back to your seats. Let's stand up. Let's practice. Ready? Stretch and take hold of it. <clears throat> Grab it. And pull it in. It's yours. All right, have a seat. So we're walking through uh, Philippians chapter 3, and we're spending a whole month in this chapter. I love doing that because um, we get to learn just a tremendous amount. This is, this is Paul writing from, from prison. And so, man, when, we, when he talks about stretching today, he's stretching through bars, right, in the prison that he's in. And he's stretching to take hold of the life that God has for him, even though it's difficult where he's at. Let's, let's read it. I'll read it to you. We're doing verses 12 through 16 today. Go back. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take 
a view of such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Failure. I'm pretty good at failure. And it's one of the few things I've done really well. One time in my 20s, I used to be invited to sing in front of people, right? Isn't that strange? Um, but in my 20s, I was invited to sing in front of a large church. And I got up on the front, and there was an organist, and we ran through the song before the service together. And the song was not an organ song. In other words, this is not the kind of song you would sing with an organ. It was called Jesus Never Fails. So uh, we started it, and the organ... I don't know exactly what happened, but she was, I think, at the end of the song, and I had just started. And uh, we tried this thing three times. And I'm going, Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. And man, we were bombing. And we, f- we quit. I actually quit. And... Uh, said, amen, and walked off, and went and sat down and went, Jesus, you never fail, but I sure am capable of it. I sure am capable of it. And I am, and I, I just am. I, I, have, I have a list. I could show it to you. Some of, it's, some of it's significant, you know, in human terms, in human success track, I have a list of things that I have not been able to do and that I, my work has not attained at, at some of these things that I have on this list. And if you, if you have one of those kinds of lists, would you just join me in, so I don't have to feel bad about my list? Do you have a list? Do you understand failure? Is there anybody in this room who doesn't understand failure? Would you please stand up? Dude, I, I would have given you... Oh, there it did, Bob! I know you better than that. <laughs> you are already standing in the back. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. And this, this is a truth. It's, a, it's one of those empirical truths that you learn from the Bible. Failure is not a person, but an event. I mean, when they... In the, in the, in the Webster Dictionary, my picture isn't next to the word Failure. But some of the events in Wikipedia are, are there, failure. Well, wow, that's, that's too depressing. Should we just move on from this point? Uh, how do we know that failure is not a person? You may be sitting there and going, dude, that's me. I'm failure. But it is not a person. Because God saw all that he had made on the sixth day. He saw all that he had made, and it was, say it with me, very good. That wasn't very convincing. Let's say it again. It was very good. Dude, does the Bible lie? No. Does, does God create failure? No. If God was a failure creator, God would be a failure. Check this one out. I read it this morning. For you created my inmost being. This is, this is King David. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So God created and it was very good, but does it stop being good? Well, sin clouds things. Sin infects things. Sin scars and mars the reality of, of that beauty, but it's not God's hand. And, and when we're born into the world, we are born uh, chosen by God, created, it says, to be holy and blameless as his children in his sight. Oh my goodness, God does not make mistakes. But... We do live in a world that's tainted with the reality of sin that has the 
the presence of the evil one, and his plan is to kill, to steal, and destroy. But the work of our living God is wonderful, fearfully and wonderfully made, and he continues his wonderful work. So even though we may experience the reality of failure within an event, God's work is wonderful. Have you ever experienced something that in an earthly sense was a human failure and then God in an eternal sense turned that something into something wonderful? Yes. Yes. God is bigger than those events. And even if you were caught up in the sin of something, God is greater than sin, and he turns things like that into beautiful things when you experience his transforming power. And the people around you see what God is capable of doing in your life. There's a future. We don't get stuck in these failure events, and we don't get stuck in the crushing weight of it. Otherwise, I would not be able to function. I just would not be able to function. If that failure and those failures were the ruler of my life, what would it, what would, what would any meaning come from. But there is a future. And a future is something that we can work hard toward. It's something beautiful. It's something meaningful. It's something precious, real, and powerful. There is a future. Some of you, as I've been talking, your list of stuff is really just mounting up. And I want to let you know there's a future. I took a slide away, uh, the next slide, because it was a video and um, I could not sync the words with the mouth movement. So I had to take it out. Uh, For some reason, Mac to PC Uh, You know, Mac's a little closer to heaven and PC is a little bit down here. So it just doesn't work very well. And, um, but it was was from the the third movie, Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien. And if you know I'm a Tolkien fan, I I read The Hobbit when I was like 10. Started reading that. 11, 12, 13, I had the whole trilogy of The Lord of the Rings done. Insane. And then I read it again and I read it again and I read it again. It's on my, uh, I have it in uh, on Kindle on my phone and I go back to it about once a month. I read something. I read something um, in, 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 in uh, the third book, The Return of the King, and it was pretty interesting. Um, um, they, they wanted to create a diversion so that Frodo could actually go, I'm just assuming you know the story, go and throw the ring into... Uh, Mount Doom, <laughs> and you probably are sitting there, this guy's talking French or something, but um, none of that makes the difference. This is the point. Gimli the dwarf said, this is an impossible thing, but this is what he says. Certainty of death, small chance for success, what are we waiting for? I think I said it just like Gimli. Didn't I sound like him? (laughs) Spot on, baby. Now, I want to tell you that uh, there's a future, but here's the reality. There is certainty of death. And in a human sense, there's small chance of success. And my question to you is, what are you waiting for? Look, Look at the words from Paul. Starting here in, in our verse, he, he, says, he says something profound. He says, not that I have already obtained all this 
or have already made perfect, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. The fact is, is that every one of us someday is going to die. And the fact is that we have to press on because living in this life has to do with the reality of the tainted infection of sin and the presence of the evil one in this life until Christ returns. Now, that devil has been defeated. He cannot determine our future, but he sure can pound and lie and steal. And we have authority over him, but man, show me a Christian who really gets that. Because one of the devil's greatest tools is discouragement. And he loves to just use that teeny little tool. There's a story about someone walking through uh, the devil's tool room, and he found this little tool, a little teeny little tool, and he picked it up, and he said, what is this? And the devil said, that's discouragement. That's my greatest tool. And he just wants to tell you, you are a failure, and he, hallelujah, is wrong. Pressing on isn't always easy. Zero chance of success. What are you waiting for? The end is decided. And Paul this morning is saying, not that I've attained all of this, not that I've reached my goal, but I press on. Why? Because the end is decided. There are four things from this passage I'd like to take hold of today. Four keys to being able to press on. And I would love for you just to take hold of these keys and take them into your heart and walk out of here in victory and in freedom and in joy. First key is we press on because of certain victory. Here's the words. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold for me. And then verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ has looked at you and all that you are and have done in the whole package that has been your reality. And he says, I see it all. And while you're yet a sinner, I die for you. Romans 8 verse, 8 verse 5. He loves you so much that he looks at you even before the foundation of the world and he knows who you are and he knows everything about you. He says, I love you. I'm going to lay my life down for you. And he takes hold of life for you by laying his life down. And he ascends into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And from that place, he sends his spirit and he brings life to you here on this side of heaven. And so Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me. Notice it doesn't say I'm going to go and win a prize like there's one big prize and the one who is the best person on this earth is going to get that prize. No. It's, it's, like, it's like soccer nowadays in the elementary school. Everybody gets a trophy. But I want to tell you that there is an impact on heaven on the life that you live now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says some pretty challenging words. Paul says this. He says... Um, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So it's not eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die and go to heaven. It's live that life that we are eternally now because how we live now has an impact on how we live eternity. 
But the entrance to heaven has been paid for. And when you go up there and you stand in front of St. Peter and he says, why should I let you into the heavenly gates? What are you going to say? I was once an usher at Bridgewood Church. And they'll go, oh, Bridgewood. And when you say Bridgewood Church, all the angels will go, Bridgewood Church. Nah, that's not what's going to happen. They're going to say, why should I let you in? And if you don't say, because Jesus Christ paid for my life by dying on the cross and his blood was shed for me, you won't get into heaven. It's not up to you. Christ has taken hold of heaven for you and gives it to you as a gift. So everybody gets the win who is belie- belongs to Jesus, but not everybody gets everything in heaven. That's up to God. There is a judgment seat. And God is encouraging us to press on and live beautiful, wonderful lives on this earth. So press on because of certain victories. Second, press on in humility. Paul, here he is. He has been forced into humility. And there's one way to become humble. Be tied to a Roman soldier until you die, right? That'll humble you. A stinky, smelly Roman soldier. If maybe he would bring an Irish setter along with him and you could sit and pet him and you'd have some comfort. But probably not. I don't think they conquered England by this time or Ireland. Paul says this, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Here he is. This, this is a guy that has pursued God with all of who he is since his conversion. But he says to us, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. He is humbly speaking these words. He's saying, you know what? Do not have a haughty attitude before God. You won't get anywhere if you say to God, now, hey, I got it. Don't worry about it. Hey, dude, back off. I got it. He invites you to say, I can't do this. I need you. I desperately, desperately need you. And it's not help me, help me, help me prayers. It's, God, I choose to allow you to take over. Do this in me. I will cooperate with you. Have your way. It takes humility to press on, to let him lead. Third, Paul says this, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead. Pressing on is through obstacles. About, about a decade ago, I had a wonderful privilege of sitting with another staff member and a young woman in my office. And for the first 10 minutes, 20 minutes of the meeting, this young woman couldn't speak. She could only cry. See, she had not been to church ever before, long, ever, since maybe ever. I don't know. But she came to church one Sunday because a friend said, oh, you're so broken, come with me to church. And as she sat in church, something happened to her. She didn't understand it yet, but the Holy Spirit met her. And she, did, she couldn't deal with the reality that God would love her. Because as she sat in my office and started to unfold her life, growing up in the home she grew up in and the abuse that, that was there, and the way she started to play that abuse out in her own life, and the self-hatred, into self-destruction and the abortion and the broken relationships. She, she couldn't really imagine that God would actually accept her and love her and the addictions. 
me and this staff member, we, we read some truth from the Word, but mainly we just prayed. And we asked the Lord to wrap His arms around this young woman and to breathe on her and to love her. And we talked about it as, as we were praying. We stop and say, is the Lord working on you? And her t- 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 sobs turned to tears of yes. Is the Lord speaking to you? Yes. What's he saying? He says, I forgive you. You are clean. And she walked with head held high, with expectation that it wasn't going to be easy because she had to lose a group of friends, otherwise crash again. But she walked courageously out the door. This is what I'm wanting at varying degrees today to happen to us as we walk out of this place today. Walk through the obstacles that have been our past and walk through the obstacles that will be our now or tomorrow with confidence of what Christ has done for you. You have been justified. You have been set free from the power of sin because the blood of Jesus has been shed for you. Walk out of here now with the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. To walk up to those obstacles with the strength and freedom and hope of the Lord Jesus Christ burning inside your veins with fire from heaven so that the obstacles do not rule. And the obstacles of your past are paid for and do not need to rule your tomorrow. Press on. Finally, as the team comes up, I invite you to press on toward maturity. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. See, there is a convictor of sin, and that's the Holy Spirit. But there is a condemner, and that is not God. There is a specific difference between condemnation and conviction. This is what the devil sounds like. He looks at you and he says to you, boy, are you stupid. Boy, are you a loser. God would never accept you. That's the worst thing I've ever seen anybody do. And he tells you to give up. That is not God. God would never, ever say that to you. God says to you, by the power of the Spirit, oops, that sin took place, did it? You let it, let it get you. It's okay. Come here. I've paid for it. Talk to me about it. There. There. I've covered it in my blood. Come on. Let's go. Dust off. Let's get moving. There are people around that need to be healed. The hearts that need to hear your story. Don't be ruled by that stuff anymore. Oh, by the way, have I told you I love you so much? Come here. He wraps his arms around you. He's 
called conviction. And there's an answer to it. Yeah, his blood. There's hope. Because what is in the future is given to you in a deposit right now, just like a bank deposit. Paul says the Holy Spirit is given as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Just take hold. Take hold of what Christ has already taken hold of for you. I invite you to stand and let's walk into the presence of the living God. And He so fills His church with power and authority that we have every strength and the power of heaven to break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus.